welcome to Acting Prime Minister. Thank you. Uh, two weeks to go till recess. We're counting down the, <laughs> the days, yes. <laughs> we are all counting down the days. We shouldn't complain. I know people will hate us for complaining about it, but I think everyone's exhausted, aren't they, in Westminster? I think they're all exhausted, and I think they've all had enough of each other. Mm. And you can see that that bit where people just have sort of, yeah, had enough of being here. And also this building, or buildings, are fundamentally unsuited to the heat. So uh, regardless of what's going on politically, just the temperature rises and you can see that we're all just overheated, basically. I think there is a, a valid point that all of this anger and this debate in politics has affected some people's mental health even, I think. Some people seem really quite damaged by the past few months that they've been through and just desperate for a holiday to kind of clear their minds a bit. I think it's really important to have time away. Uh, and yes, I think you know, it has been an extraordinary period in British politics. You talk to someone like Ken Clark, who's been here for what, 50 yeah. years, and he says never done anything like it. And I think there's pressure, there's been pressure from constituents who feel very passionate about some of the issues, pressure from local parties, you know, we mm. know a number of MPs are under uh, threats from their local parties. And, and actually, um, being in a perpetual state of falling out with your nearest and dearest, whether it's family or whether it's a party, and I think people kind of underestimate that when you're involved in a party, and I joined my party on 16, yeah. you know, my, my friends are here, um, uh, not all my social life, I should say, but, uh, you know, my husband is a leader of a, of a local council. Uh, lots of good friends are in, in politics. So when you're arguing with, with people who you're meant to be on the same side mm. with, it is just emotionally, it's wearying. And it's not productive or constructive. Yeah, I often say to people, imagine, you know, in your office, in your workplace, if you were sitting yeah. at your desk constantly arguing with the person sitting next to you who was supposed to be helping you on that project or whatever. I mean, it is, it is a crazy environment to be in. Anyway, you know how this podcast works. Yeah, yeah. We're going to appoint you as Prime Minister for the next Thank you. Ha half an hour or so. And you did run to be Prime Minister in 2016. We I didn't quite make the... But I, I thought about it and then thought, thought better of it. <laughs> <laughs> and we thought you might run this time and then you didn't. Um, was there a reason why you just felt that maybe this, this wasn't the right opportunity? Or? Yeah, I think the time was not right. Look, I mean, I've been very clear about my, you know, remain tendencies from 2016. Uh, and, um, and the party, I think, is in a very different uh, place. Uh, and I was pretty sure, and I think events have borne uh, it out, that mm. the party would want people who were either committed Brexiteers or people who were very, uh, not just reconciled to Brexit, but, but you know, really prepared to, uh, you know, uh, carry it out and refuse and everything else. And I think that's what we're seeing play out with Boris Johnson and Jeremy Hunt at the moment. Do you think you would ever go for it again? I, I, I honestly, I don't know. Um, I mean, look, at the end of the day, I think most of us, if you're in politics, have ambitions to be at the top of our parties and to, you know, make decisions and, and everything else. And I, I'm really interested in leadership and the qualities of, of leadership and everything else. It'd be a great privilege to do it. Honestly, I think the last three years have been so divisive in the party. Um, it's going to take quite a long time, I think, before they're ready for a, a one nation conservative like me. So you grew up in Surrey. I did. Uh, you went to private school and you went to Oxford and you were quite heavily involved in politics. Yep. And you, as you say, you joined the Conservative Party when you were 16, which I is did. quite young. Yeah, yeah. What got you into politics? Well, my dad was a local councillor. And okay. so I guess I grew up in a political household. Uh, and so we always had a debate about politics and, and history. Um, and I think eventually when I was about 16, he kind of knew I was involved in or interested in current affairs and politics. And he said, why don't you just go and try the Young Conservatives? He said, if you don't agree with them, then go and try another <laughs> political party. I always liked debating at school. And, um, and he was right. And I kind of arrived at my Young Conservative branch in Surbiton and kind of felt like I'd, I'd, I was in the right place. Yeah. And it was fun. It was social, but it was also, you know, political. Lots of It was the end of Margaret Thatcher. So I joined... I sort of stopped, got involved in 88 and yeah. properly joined in 89. So this mm -hmm. summer is my 30th anniversary of party membership. Wow, OK. I mean, not many people these days are Conservatives when they're 16. <laughs> Were you There's only... a few. There's a there few, are yeah. some. I'm not, I'm not dismissing the idea, but it is quite rare. Yeah. Were you, you know, were your friends conservatives? Did you, did people at school say to you, what, what are you doing? Why aren't you well, yeah, there's said that. I mean, I think a lot, of, and a lot of my friends still say, rather you than me, I think particularly after the last couple of years. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, I think people were interested in, um, uh, interested in politics. But I think people, yes, it was, it was not normal for mm. people to take their interest in politics into joining a party uh, and, um, you know, going to party political events like party conference. OK, so look, let's put you in number 10 now. <laughs> you've made it all the way from being a party member at 16 to, to prime minister, the top job in the country. And you're going to have to deal with quite a lot of things yes, on your plate. Yes, a lot of entry, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot to do. <laughs> number one, you've got to appoint a new ambassador to Washington. Yeah. Who, do you, who would you love to have? 
I'd like to have somebody that's going to irritate Donald Trump. Um, because I think actually it is completely appalling that the US president has said such things about both the, uh, well, she should be my predecessor, the predecessor prime minister, but mm. also uh, our former ambassador. And uh, look, of course, countries uh, are going to have fallings out. And it's important that we, we've got a long and deep relationship with the US and, you know, allies and friends should be able to tell each other some difficult truths. But I think it's very, very damaging that uh, Sir Kim Derrick's uh, memos found their way uh, into the media. Ambassadors have got to be able to tell governments what is going on in the foreign administrations where they are um, they're based. Uh, and so, yeah, I would find somebody uh, who absolutely would upset all those who are celebrating Sir Kim Derrick's departure, and particularly Donald Trump. Somebody, but somebody's going to tell truth to power. It, you know, it's got to be somebody that you trust is going to tell you when the British government has made an error in terms of its handling of the US relationship, but equally when the US relate or the US administration um, is not, you know, perhaps not taking on board what the UK government is saying to them. The Prime Minister defended him, uh, Sir Kim yeah. Derrick. And not everyone else has done. Yep. I mean, do you think it's regrettable that actually there was an opportunity this week for both candidates, both leadership mm -hmm. candidates, to come out and say that they supported him and, and Boris Johnson wouldn't do that? I do think it's regrettable. I'd be interested to know from Boris why not. Um, I guess there's always, you know, whether there is some uh, history. I don't know whether Boris had any dealings with uh, Sir Kim when he was the Foreign Secretary, whether there's something else uh, going on there. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, one of the things I would like to do as Prime Minister is to create a proper team, you know, and not just team around the cabinet table, but team of, of UK PLC, mm. you know, to recreate the atmosphere we had in 2012 when we went to the Olympics, which means that basically when somebody from your team is under fire, you've got to support them. That doesn't mean that privately you're not going, well, actually, you know, um, let's, let's think about what you were, I don't know, saying or what was going on, but, but publicly, absolutely, you've got to be there. 100% behind your, your fellow team member. Particularly if they're an ambassador who, yeah. you know, they're, they're supposed to be civil servants, essentially. They're not supposed to be politicised in that well, way. Well, you see, this is one of the problems we've seen over the last couple of years has been the, um, well, the growing attempts to politicise the civil service, not by the civil service, but by people outside mm. who frankly should know better. You know, we do have um, a, a wonderful, impartial, talented civil service. And I know as a former minister, there are times when they will drive you mad because you know you want to do something and there's always a reason not to do it or it's been tried before or perhaps minister we might you know try it like this and everything else but that is their job their job is to have the institutional corporate memory for the country and to say if you've got great civil servants actually what they will do if you listen to them properly is say well actually minister that's very interesting um let's not do it like that but you could do it like this and you'd achieve the same thing i mean i had great advice and yeah i had mm. uh, you know sometimes so you got on well with civil because yeah. a lot of people say you know the criticism <clears throat> of the civil service is that they're biased towards the status quo so for example with brexit they're biased towards remain and they're very reluctant to change their minds did you did you have sort of frustrations when you were education secretary? Did you ever come against up against that kind of reluctance to to, to make changes? I wouldn't say reluctance to make changes, I, but I do think part of their raison d'etre actually is is if not to preserve the status quo, it's to remind ministers of the status quo. I actually see that in Parliament as well, where if there's a tied vote, the speaker has to vote for the status quo, um, and you know there's a reason for for that, which is if you're going to make fundamental change, you should think about it, and mm. you should expect as a minister to be challenged. Now there are times, obviously, um, and in extreme circumstances, where you have to issue a ministerial direction to say I want this to happen, and there are times when there's just a you know a, a clash of personalities, mm -hmm. and actually a wise cabinet secretary or permanent secretary will find a way to move somebody on if that relationship is clearly not going to work and pr provide frustrations all round. But actually, I found that, you know, again, if you create a team atmosphere, you know, Team Morgan or, or whatever it is, uh, you know, people want to do their best for you. Mm. And they want to do their best for, for, for the UK. And again, if you as a minister are acting in the national interest, my experience, the civil service will completely respond mm. to that. But they need to know that when the chips are down, you're going to be on their side. And we've had this debate on the select committee, which is actually, again, People, civil servants and others who give us evidence should not be attacked for putting forward evidence in the course of their job. You know, sometimes they are representing the government's position, sometimes they're representing a perfectly worthy position, which we can disagree with, but they should not be attacked. You know, and some of our civil servants last couple of years have been actually receiving death threats for the way that they are perceived through the media lens to have carried out their jobs or the way that MPs have attacked them. That is completely unacceptable. You know, and again, you know, if I had a day as, as PM, 
I, I would like to challenge this head on. I mean, this is none of this is a culture that is conducive to the good national psyche of this country. Mm. <coughs> we still need an ambassador to Washington, actually. Okay, all right. Then <laughs> I forgot I about point. that one. Um, <laughs> what about George Osborne? I mean, some people think genuinely well, I mean, that he actually, might be in the yeah, frame. I, well, whether it's whether it's it's George, whether there's other talented politicians. Um, Nigel Farage. Know. No, definitely not <laughs> Nigel Farage. Somebody mentioned Liam Fox the other day. Um, and, um, you know, I think it's got to be somebody who, it, it does have to be somebody who um, uh, perhaps understands Washington a little bit, because mm. it's, uh, as I understand, I've only been there a couple of times, but I think it's, um, it's quite a sophisticated uh, place to be. You would understand who the players are and how you lobby for influence and, and everything else. Uh, but you looked at me quizzically and I said sophisticated. Well, I was wondering where you're going with sophisticated because <laughs> Kim Darrick doesn't think it's a particularly sophisticated administration. Well, and that may be part of the issue with the current administration, and particularly the top of the administration. Uh, he's fairly <laughs> blunt about what he thinks about things. And there is, look, I mean, I think sometimes there's something to be said for that. And I think we all dance around the head of a pin without just saying, you know, what we actually think about mm. things, which does drive the public completely mad. You know, when people sit on the well, podcasts or the Today programme and refuse to answer the question. Yeah. And then you want to shout at the TV, you'll go, for goodness sake, just answer what is there. So um, it could be a politician. Um, it could be somebody who uh, perhaps, I mean, I suspect there are perhaps other civil servants, senior civil servants, other people in the diplomatic service um, who would be very different. I mean, I, I guess I would probably appoint, try to appoint somebody. It might be somebody very different from Sir Kim Derrick. Mm -hmm. So perhaps not just a, a, a perceived you know, establishment type figure. Uh, but somebody, again, who is also not going to be somebody who is going to necessarily want to curry favour with the White House, because mm. that's not their job. No, they're here. They're, they're there to, to serve Britain rather than to, to, to please America. OK, so the phone's ringing now because world leaders want to speak to the new Prime Minister. <laughs> you can speak to any world leader first. I mean, a lot of people say President Trump because of the special yeah. relationship. But, you know, maybe it was President Trump for you. Who else would you like to speak to? I'd like to speak to President Macron. Okay. Because I think in terms of, um, I'm assuming that Brexit is still, uh, you know, going on. Um, I, do I mean, think I think we can assume that for quite a while. Yeah. Several decades, really. Uh, <laughs> so I think President Macron uh, would be it would be an important uh, person to, to speak to. And, uh, you know, obviously Angela Merkel uh, as well. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of other relationships, um, I mean, I think probably President Abe, um, Prime Minister Abe, sorry, from Japan. Yeah, yeah. Um, when I was Education Secretary, I went to uh, Japan and had a fantastic, um, it was actually a G7 education ministers, and that, lots of similarities. And obviously, we know we've got a lot of Japanese uh, companies mm -hmm. uh, based um, based here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just trying to think of other places around the I'm just wondering the if there's world. someone you kind of really admire as a world leader that you think has really got, got it together. Well, actually, um, uh, uh, Prime Minister Ardern from New Zealand. Yeah. Who I think, uh, you know, when the awful terrorist attacks happened earlier mm. this year, I think she really showed outstanding qualities of, of, of leadership um, and boiled it all down to something very simple, which is actually, I think she said, didn't she, to a, a young boy, I'm here to keep you safe. Yeah. And that's actually ultimately what a leader of a country is there to do. Safe meaning many different things in a way, yeah. uh, from protection from attacks, but also creating security, financial security, and yeah, security yeah. as well. Uh, but I think that she uh, really, as I say, I think she showed great, great leadership. Okay. You need a cabinet as well. <laughs> Just a couple of names. Who would you who would you love to have in there? Oh, um, well, um, I mean, I would like to have. I would probably have George Osborne back again, not okay. necessarily as as Chancellor, uh, but he got a great political mind, um, and um, he was always the person who was best at anticipating, you know, what the opposition were going to were going to do and how they were going to uh, going to behave. Um, I think. Um, do you think he would like to? I shouldn't think so at all. I, no? think he's prob I don't know. I, I think he's like, probably. I just wonder what his game plan is because he's probably escaped. Do you think? I don't. Yeah. Think he's happy with that. I, well, I don't. I think when you've got politics in your blood, and I think particularly if you leave at a time not of your choosing. Although I know he he decided to resign with the 2017 election, mm. but you know he obviously you know was not kept on in government in 2016. I think there's always a yearning there, actually, potentially to to to, to either come back or to to do things uh, differently. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, who else uh, would I um, would I have? Um, I think, you know, you want grown-ups in your cabinet. I mean, I, I'm probably, um, because I'm a One Nation Conservative, mm. I, you know, I deal with people from across the, across the house um, on different sides and everything else. I wouldn't necessarily want to be a coalition, uh, but certainly uh, working with, with the Lib Dems uh, in mm -hmm. 2010 worked very well. Um, but also, I mean, I think in terms of my predecessor education secretary, one of the people who most impressed me was David Blunkett. Okay. Uh, who said to me that being education secretary was a, you know, a wonderful privilege. Mm. Uh, and, um, you know, I think there's something actually in having, you know, talented, talented people. 
particularly at the moment, you know, we've got a big challenge on as a, as a country. I think uh, lots of things that we need to sort out. Um, so um, who else? And I've got to choose what some of my existing colleagues as well to put in the cabinet. I mean, you can if you want to. It'd be quite interesting to see who you choose. <laughs> Um, well, I think Matt Hancock's doing brilliantly as the Health Secretary. Okay. I think that uh, George Freeman, as um, you know, I'd like to see him as a proper science and innovation mm -hmm. minister. Quite a radical thinker. He's got amazing, exactly, brain for, for policy and, 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 and everything else. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, uh, my good friend Robert Buckland deserves um, mm -hmm. uh, a, a promotion into, into Cabinet. Um, and I'm going to stop there before I, before yeah. I kill off anybody else's political <laughs> careers by my endorsement. And you mentioned that you're a One Nation Conservative. Yeah. What do you think your values would be as Prime Minister? Because not everyone will know what a One Nation Conservative is, and we'll try yeah. not to use jargon. I'm sure. just as guilty as anyone else. Um, so how, in layman's terms, how would you describe what it is that you believe in in terms of your, your Conservative principles? I think it's about trying to bridge any divisions and, and gaps. So, I mean, the One Nation term comes from the 19th century, basically. It was about saying we should be one nation, and the Israeli was writing about two nations of, I think, you know, it was particularly rich and poor, but industrialised and non-industrialised. And I think we know that our, there are a lot of divisions in our country, geographic, educational, uh, you know, obviously in terms of you know, wealth inequality and that sort of thing. I think what I would say is that as Prime Minister, my attitude would be, I don't want to create, I don't want to talk about the other. And I think it's really easy in politics sometimes to set out what you're against mm -hmm. rather than what you're for. Mm -hmm. um, and we're very good about saying, you know, we're against people who, I don't know, don't want to work or... Uh, you know, people who, who we want to be, you know, um, only for people who want to be entrepreneurs. And I think recognising the rich diversity in this country uh, and trying to say to, to, bring, to bring people together. It, I know it sounds a bit wishy-washy, but I seriously think that is so what we need at the moment. Mm -hmm. it's, essentially, it's almost like, you know, believing that the party should be a broad umbrella of yeah, very much so. covering, you know, rather than being on the hard right yeah. or... You know, well, the, the point about politics is we're representatives and we've got to, um, and I, I've obviously pushed a lot for more women in Parliament, mm -hmm. you know, we've got to look like the country that we aspire to represent. And I was doing a thing in Treasury Secretary recently and somebody said this great phrase to me, you can't be what you can't see. We're not going to get people voted Conservative if they look at the party and they can't see anybody who looks or sounds like them mm -hmm. or thinks like them. Mm -hmm. um, so we absolutely need to be a broad church, you know, across age, gender, ethnicity, disability, sexuality, you know, you name it. We need people up there who somebody goes, actually, that person is inspirational and they have got there. And actually, you know, I'm a, um, a young you know, gay woman and actually I can see somebody just like me in Cabinet. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I think... Uh, actually, you know, that the Conservative Party might have something to say to me. Yeah. Um, talking about bringing people back together, we've okay. got to cover Brexit. You're going to have to talk, <laughs> sort out Brexit as Prime Minister. Oh, fine, okay. um, and we can do that in like five yeah, minutes. Yeah. Um, you have actually come up with a compromise plan. <laughs> we probably haven't got time to get into the details of it, but you have been searching for a compromise yeah. as an MP. Do you think that you'd have time before October the 31st as Prime Minister to, to sort of try and knock out that compromise with the EU and get a deal that could pass through Parliament? I think it is possible. It's a big, tall order. There's no doubt about it. And, you know, whoever genuinely is going to become Prime Minister in two weeks' time is really going to have that. It's, yeah. it's a, it is a big challenge. Um, I, I mean, it relies on, on goodwill and pragmatism on all sides. Uh, obviously, UK, EU, uh, you know, uh, obviously, particularly this issue about the Irish border uh, with the, the government in, in Dublin. Um, uh, whether you can nail down all the details, I think it's very, it's very difficult mm. uh, to, to do that. Whether you can get enough of an outline that actually the House of Commons does say, yes, we're going to go with this. And of course, you've got to negotiate it with the EU, yeah. uh, which is a tall order. Um, you're right. I mean, I've been trying to search for or identify if we didn't have the backstop, what could we do about having yeah, some other arrangements? Yeah, alternative arrangements, yeah. Uh, I think there are some other arrangements, but, you know, they have to, and they're not going to be sorted by the 31st of October. But I guess with all these things, if people could see the direction of travel and on all sides could say, actually, we think we can get there and this is what we're, how we're going to negotiate and actually we're prepared to change this or to clarify that, that might be enough. And, and I, I, mean, I think, in a way, the last three years have me searched, Georgia, I do think that people on all sides now want to get on with mm. their lives. Uh, the EU wants to get on, I think the UK wants to get on, the House of Commons wants to get on with what it, what it does. Uh, and in a way, it's like one of those big things that until you've dealt with it somehow, we can't move on. We are, we are stuck in UK politics. What actually strikes me, and I think this will happen over the summer, is the rest of the country has kind of moved on. I mean, mm. there was a period at the end of March and April and you were reporting on it. I mean, you know, it was just extraordinary. Yeah. And the feelings were very high. Everything was very volatile. We might go back there in September, October. Mm. I hope that if it was me as Prime Minister or whoever it is, it is able to head that off and just try to find a way through. 
Do you think that you would extend the deadline again? Well, I wouldn't have it as such a completely rigid deadline. I, I, okay. I do think extension is, is <clears throat> undesirable for the reasons I've set out. Um, but I supported Michael Gove in the campaign for the leadership, yeah. and he, I think, was very clear, rightly so, that if a if deal was inside, there, or yeah, you know. And I mean, I've, I've negotiated enough deals in my lifetime. I'm an you know, ex uh, uh, lawyer, um, and you know, it's always the way you set a deadline. We're going to sign the documents at six o'clock tonight, and you can guarantee at six o'clock next morning they're not still not quite done, but they're nearly there. I, 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 I'd hope that both sides would not walk away at that moment. Mm. Do you think, as an, an MP or as Prime Minister, you would want to prevent no deal? Because, I mean, that's going to come well, around, uh, isn't it? September, it is going to come around. It is going to come around. Look, I think no deal um, will, be, will be deeply damaging. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think people, um, you know, when the Brexiteers talk about a little bit of disruption, um, you know, the honest truth is nobody knows. You know, yeah. although we've taken evidence on the Treasury Select Committee, you know, nobody, nobody's seen a dislocation of trade policy or trade relationship in the way that Brexit, a hard Brexit, a sudden Brexit would be. And we don't know what the damage would be. We put mitigations in uh, and, and everything else. So, yes, I mean, I think... That, that, but the best way to avoid a no deal outcome is to have a deal. And that's what frustrates yeah. me about a lot of people who spend their time plotting, trying to work out how to stop a, a no deal Brexit. That is a noble cause. But the better way, surely, goes back to my thing about it's not what you're against, it's what you're for, yeah. is to be for a deal and find a way through. There's all this talk as well about proroguing Parliament, suspending Parliament so that a no deal Brexit could be kind of railroaded through and that you guys as MPs wouldn't be able to stop it. What did you think of Sir John Major saying today that he would actually be willing to take that to judicial review if someone, try, if Boris Johnson, tried to prorogue Parliament? Well, I, mean, I thought it's extraordinary. I'm a great fan of uh, Sir John's, uh, you know, and I think that he, if it were to happen, I, I still think, you know, and the One Nation Hustings, we quizzed both Boris Johnson and Jeremy Hunt about prorogation. Neither said it was an option that they would be wanting to pursue. Um, I think it would be extraordinary. I think it would lead to a constitutional crisis. Um, but I'm very pleased that we have a Prime Minister, a past Prime Minister like Sir John, who is still willing to stick his neck above the parapet and say, I would not put up with this. And I think that is an important test of, of national leadership, and he's still got it. So you would support him in that judicial review and well, think that I, was the right thing to do? Or? I mean, at the end of the day, if, if, if that was the only way to, 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 to stop, you know, we're hurtling towards a no deal for which we were clearly unprepared. I go back to my point about Prime Minister there to create security for the people of this country. Um, that is a, a, a road to, to mass insecurity, I'd have, I'd have thought, in all sorts of different ways. But, you know, again, it's so difficult because with all of this, we spend a lot of our time debating the what ifs and, and you know, the, the what could happen scenarios. Um, and actually, I think we'd all be better served. You know, I completely respect Sir John for saying what he's, he said. As I say, I think it's a mark of leadership he's prepared to step up and put his head above the parapet like that. But I think the task for those of us in Parliament now is to find a way through the Brexit impasse. OK, let's get back to you being Prime Minister. <laughs> and what I've noticed about Prime Ministers over time is that it is actually possible to kind of reinvent yourself a bit as a Prime Minister, yeah. to change your values, to change your mind on things. I mean, we've seen it a bit with Theresa May in terms of LGBT rights. Yeah. And she's now very pro-LGBT yeah, yeah. rights. She actually voted against equality legislation as an MP. Uh, you've been asked a million times about voting against equal marriage. Yeah, yeah. I noticed this week you voted for Absolutely. equal marriage in Northern Ireland. Yeah, yeah. So you too have gone through your, your own change in, uh, in, in sort of opinions about this kind of, kind of stuff. And you're on the record as saying that you, you regret all that. So we don't, go, we don't want to go over that again. But um, I'm wondering whether there's anything that you'd love to do as Prime Minister that kind of would undo some of the things that maybe you think, oh, you know, when I was younger, I wish I hadn't done that. Or, you know, there's some, maybe so there's some political regrets that you think, actually, now I'm, I'm clearer in my mind and I would, I would like to go full guns blazing on such and such an issue. Yeah, I mean, look, I think, uh, firstly, I think, I do think in politics, we, 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 we have these amazing jobs and you get to meet lots of people all the time. And the question is, do you choose to listen to them mm. uh, or do you choose to sort of plough on and go, I know best? And I do think, actually, it, it should be regarded as something to be, whether it's to be noted or congratulated, if you say, I got something wrong and I changed my mind mm. on it, um, rather than to be, you know, sort of saying, well, you know, why everything else? So, so thank you for what you've, you've said. Um, what I do differently, I mean, I think, I'm sure there are things that I've, I've, I've done, and I, I know somebody got, you know, the, I, I gave a speech when I was Education Secretary, and it made it sound like I wasn't a fan of the arts and creative industries, which could not be further from the truth. As an art student and somebody who is a, you know, a singer, I'm certainly not a painter, that's for sure, or an artist, and, you know, I believe those subjects are very, very important. But, mm. um, you know, it was also about saying, actually, the sciences are there and they're important for the future of the country um, uh, uh, as well. So, you know, um, if I could do something to demonstrate, um, you know, that, that I am a great fan of arts and creative industries, 
maybe as Prime Minister I should spend a day going to, um, going to admire our fabulous creative industries, our museums and our theatres uh, and our art galleries and everything else in this, um, in this country. Um, just don't commission any new artwork for Downing okay. Street because that'll just end up being a bad that, story that, that, exactly, and about how much exactly. money you've spent. And People will get upset about that <laughs> and everything else. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, um, but uh, look, I think the other thing is probably just the way we conduct ourselves. I do think that the, the tone um, of, of politics, you know, actually having, a, having hopefully a national leader, mm. uh, the first thing would be to have a cabinet, a cabinet meeting that didn't leak. Um, and uh, well, we were all the team sitting around the table together, and and then to, you know, a bit boring for me that, that though. Sorry, I know, <laughs> I know, I know, but but better I think for for all of us. Um, look, one of the things I did <clears throat> very early on being an MP, um, which didn't involve party law or anything else, was I led with Charles Walker the first ever general debate on mental health in mm -hmm. the House of Commons chamber, and I think that that helped in terms of the challenging of of stigma around mental health. And so there are sometimes things you can do because you've got this fantastic platform that just change things. And there may well be issues uh, that actually people are just feeling that they're rather unnoticed mm. or unappreciated. And you're able to use the Office of Prime Minister and the House of Commons and, you know, in that way, just to highlight the tremendous work that people do do in this country. OK, great. Let's round it off now with just a few quick questions okay. at the end, so for, just for fun. Um, who would you rather have dinner with as Prime Minister? Jeremy Corbyn or Nigel Farage? Oh, Jeremy Corbyn. Really? I, I just don't think I could sit at a table with Nigel Farage for... I just don't think I could do it, sorry. <laughs> um, you'd have to drink a lot of alcohol as well because he, he doesn't have a sober dinner. Although actually he's a bit healthier these no, days. So maybe... I think that, that, that told us Maybe that's libelous to uh, even suggest that he can, uh, can't survive a dinner without uh, a drink. Um, how would you relax as Prime Minister? What do you enjoy doing? Um, I like going running. Mm -hmm. um, uh, going to the cinema, going to, well, I haven't, I'm, well, I'd love to go to the theatre more often, but never seem to get a chance. Just even sitting down and watching a programme as it goes out live would be, as opposed to relying on catch up, which is what I seem to do. <laughs> as long as you uh, watch the ITV debate. Uh, okay, all right. Yeah, well, I watched the first bit of it. I didn't okay. watch all of it yet, sorry. Okay, all right. Well, okay, it's better than nothing. <laughs> um, where would you go on holiday? Where do you enjoy travelling to when you want to? Well, um, uh, I have an 11 year old son, so a long haul is kind of, has been kind of out uh, mm -hmm. for the last few years. Um, the best holiday I ever had was um, on going on safari in South Africa. Nice. And that was just total, you, because you're cut off, even though it's only a couple of days, you mm. just feel like you've been away for a long, long time. Yeah, yeah. And lastly, what do you think is the scandal that would bring you down? <laughs> <laughs> if I had one, Paul, I'm certainly not going to tell you on this podcast. <laughs> oh, damn it. <laughs> I try every time. All right, Nicky Morgan, thank you so much for coming thank on. It's been a pleasure. Much. Thanks. <laughs>